his authority. Together, let us confess our sins. Lord and Savior of us all, with Peter we confess that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Forgive us when what we expect of you is self-serving, focused more on what you can do to rescue us than on what we can do to serve you. When we look to you primarily for relief from life's trials and tribulations, remind us of your call to live sacrificially, giving of ourselves for others' sake and for your glory. This we ask in your holy name, offering our silent prayers of personal confession. The psalmist once proclaimed the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Rejoice, for your sins have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Turn around and offer the peace at a safe distance. Let us pray. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you reveal to us this morning and be obedient to your will. Create in us a hunger for your word that it may nourish us in life-enhancing ways. Amen. If you would like to follow along today, there are Bibles in the pews in front of you. You can take those out. And it is on page 392. We will be in the book of Job, chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 13 to 22. Again, that's page 392 if you use your pew Bible. Hear the word of the Lord. One day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell on them and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The Chaldeans formed three columns, made a raid on the camels, and carried them off, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came across the desert struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. This is the word of the Lord. Pray with me.
steadfast God in this time of uncertainty. Speak to us with clarity and with assurance that we may look to you for hope and promise. This we ask in the name of your Son and our Redeemer. Amen. As you might expect, the sermon title is incorrect. Actually, the new sermon title is Grace Responds to Corona. During the season of Lent, Laura and I have been synchronizing our messages with a study by Reverend Adam Hamilton entitled Simon Peter, Flawed but Faithful Disciple. This morning's theme, what's in a name, was meant to refer to the various names that we call Jesus and the explanations associated with them, the expectations associated with them. Scripture refers to Jesus as the Christ, as Lord, the Son of God, the light of the world, the door to the sheepfold, the bread of life. Scripture refers to Jesus as the good shepherd, the true vine, the way, the truth, and the life, and the resurrection and the life. In a moment of spiritual insight, Peter proclaimed, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. When Jesus revealed what this proclamation implied, a trip to Jerusalem, rejection by the religious authorities there, suffering, death, and ultimately resurrection, Peter pushed back. He expected his Savior to liberate the faithful from all of the trials and the tribulations of mortal existence, not to identify with them as he endured trials and tribulations of his own. Jesus responded harshly, noting that Peter's misguided expectations were much more in tune with human thought than with who he actually was, with what God intended him to be. Though our order of worship this morning comes together around this theme, Events from the last week have compelled me to cast aside the sermon I had prepared to the sermon I had prepared in order to address the pandemic in which we find ourselves. Though I won't be concentrating on the medical recommendations identified to combat this outbreak, I entreat you to safeguard yourself fastidiously by frequently washing your hands, by protected contact with potentially infected surfaces, and by social distancing. The session has mobilized a medical response team to make comprehensive recommendations regarding how grace will help to flatten the curve of this disease. Liz Yurick, Kathy Beebe, and Kathy McLaughlin all healthcare, healthcare professionals, along with Laura and Kara and me, will be meeting this afternoon to formulate recommended responses that will maximize your well being. Recommendations from this task force will be presented to the session for consideration and for immediate action. I encourage you to refer frequently to the church website and your email for updates on inevitable cancellations. If you don't have a computer, call the church office to indicate the most effective way to reach you. Know that we are taking this situation very seriously and we will model a response that seeks to balance the necessity of isolation on the one hand with the need to do all we can to stay connected on the other hand. Our Reformed tradition refers to Scripture as the living word. 
In part, this means that the Bible provides us with situations which speak poignantly to life as we experience it. When contemplating the section of Scripture to share with you this morning, the first chapter of Job came immediately to mind. Job, an upright and faithful individual, was accosted by a series of tragedies that turned his life upside down. The Sabaeans carried off his oxen and killed all those who were tending them. Fire from heaven engulfed his sheep and the shepherds as well. The Chaldeans raided his camels and struck down those who were watching over them. And as if this were not sufficiently, sufficiently catastrophic, the house in which all his children were gathered succumbed to the force of a mighty wind, leaving no survivors. Job was unquestionably grief-stricken, but... He tempered his anguish with an affirmation of faith. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. To some extent, this morning you and I can identify with what Job experienced as successive waves of distressing news accosted him. The spread of the coronavirus, COVID-19, has progressed unchecked, forcing all of us to take it seriously by implementing essential precautions, preparing for a period of protective isolation has precipitated a run on items we deem essential to see us through. Uncertainty with what lies ahead, accompanied by a dramatic reduction in the price of oil, has had a gut-wrenching effect on the stock market. As the need for widespread isolation intensifies, people's livelihood is threatened, leaving many with inadequate income to survive. This, combined with insufficient capacity to test for the virus, and with a, and a concern for our medical infrastructure's ability to handle a crisis of this magnitude, has left us feeling helpless and vulnerable. This morning, we know how Job must have felt so long ago. So, for me, hopefully for you, the question that surfaces is this. What do we expect of our Lord and Savior when life comes to us in ways that generate feelings of helplessness and vulnerability? Not long before Jesus inquired of Peter and the other disciples, who do you say that I am? People came to him on a mountainside, bringing their infirmed. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that they put them at his feet and he cured them, so that the crowd was amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and together they praised the God of Israel. With all of these miracles fresh on Peter's mind, one can surmise what expectation for someone to rescue him from his own feelings of helplessness and vulnerability, to eradicate his dis-ease, to make everything all right. But when all was said and done, that's not what Peter got. He got God, who experienced the depth of human suffering, to walk with him and to, pour, and to support him in his suffering, compassionately seeing him through periods of helplessness and vulnerability. It occurs to me that in the situation in which we find ourselves, this is precisely what you and I should expect. Case in point, 
Annie Flint Johnson was born on Christmas Eve in the year 1866. She was three years old when her mother died while giving birth to her younger sister. Shortly thereafter, her father succumbed to an incurable disease. He willed Annie and her sister to the Flint family, who fortunately adopted them and raised them. But the Flints died when Annie was relatively young, leaving her to care for her sibling, even while she was significantly immobilized by arthritis. Confined to a wheelchair, she began making hand-lettered cards with the verses that had come to her, verses she put down on paper. The verses were a testament to the blessings she had received, even as wave after wave of trial and tribulation washed over her. One of her most poignant and insightful poems goes like this. God has not promised skies always blue, flowers strewn pathways all our lives through. God has not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. God has not promised we shall not know toil and temptation, trouble and woe. He hath not told us we shall not bear many a burden and many a care. God has not promised smooth roads and wide, swift, easy travel needing no guide, never a mountain rocky and steep, never a river turbid and deep. But God has promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace from the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy and undying love. The Christ the Son of the living God, doesn't promise to shield us from that which elicits feelings of helplessness and vulnerability. But he does promise to sojourn with us until the darkness of disease gives way to the light of healing, until the devastation of grief yields to the calming influence of comfort until helplessness and vulnerability resolve into restored confidence and resilience, until despair vanishes and hope prevails. As Jesus sojourns with you and me, with millions, billions across the world today, You and I are called to sojourn with each other, looking for opportunities to be mutually supportive, encouraging and helpful even as we practice essential social distancing. Though we will likely be separated from each other for an uncertain period of time to come, I encourage you to look for ways to connect with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And on a practical note, please strive to maintain your financial support until things refer to some semblance of normal. Your sustained giving via the internet or by snail mail will keep us financially solve it. Whatever lies ahead, know that we are stronger together than we are in isolation. We are stronger together knowing that because God is with us, we are not alone. With the psalmist, we boldly proclaim God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam. The God of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Thanks be to God. Amen. This morning, our prayer is a healing prayer, 
And there is a way, if you would like to respond, you will hear a phrase over and over again. Jesus Christ, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. So I will start, Jesus Christ, lover of all. And if you would like to respond, just say, bring healing, bring peace. Let us pray. Christ our Lord, long ago in Galilee, many who were sick and suffering needed friends to bring them to your side. Confident of your goodness, we now bring to you those who are in need of your healing touch, those who are ill in body, whose illness, if long or painful or difficult to cure, those who are in quarantine or battling symptoms of the coronavirus, those who suffer restless days and sleepless nights. Jesus Christ, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. we lift to you those who are troubled in mind, distressed by the past, or anxious about the future, especially those who are at the highest risk for suffering from the coronavirus. We lift up those who are trapped and cast down with fear during this time. Jesus Christ, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. We lift up those for whom light has been turned to darkness by the death of a loved one, the breaking of a friendship, or the fading of hope. In the silence, we lift those names of those who are in need of prayer and heavy on our hearts. Jesus Christ, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. We ask for your guidance for those who are engaged in medical research, that they may persevere with vision and energy. For those who administer agencies of health and welfare, that they may have wisdom and compassion. For nurses and doctors who are tirelessly working to bring healing to those in their care and for our leaders to have justice and empathy on those that they serve. Jesus Christ, lover of all, bring, bring healing, healing, bring peace. We lift our prayers to you as we pray the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would like you to take out your connection cards. The front is where you can put your name. We are so glad that you are here today with us. And on the back, there are ways that you can... Be involved. Not sure what that's going to look like in the next couple of weeks. But still, if you want to check um, a spot that looks interesting to you, go ahead and do that. As Pastor Jim said, the offering plates are in the narthex following worship. So you can place your um, offering there. And you can also leave your connection card in the offering plate. We try to do things decently and in order. So I won't try to uh, suggest what our medical response team and the session may decide shortly. Uh, but I will tell you that if the decision is made to not worship together for a while, we will be streaming the scripture reading and the sermon live each Sunday morning until we can come back together in this place. Uh, if you can't catch it then, it's it will be available on our website. Uh, through those means, hopefully, we will stay together as a worshiping community, mutually 
supporting one another and relying on God's support through this time of helplessness and vulnerability. Please rise for our benediction. <clears throat> Go forth knowing that God indeed promises to be with you. God is with you when life blesses you. God is with you when life is uncertain and frightening. Go forth knowing that God holds you in the palm of his hand. Go forth to be as supportive and encouraging as you can to your brothers and sisters in Christ. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Go in peace. God, go with you. Amen.